Hi, Rose. Hi, Rose, you can hear me? Rose, you can hear me? And hi, Christine, as well. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, hi, Christine. Nice to be here. Uh, pleasure seeing you to welcome. Um, just testing whether we are audible. Um, Rose, Rose, you can hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Ah, fantastic. Yes, yes, very loud and clear. All right. All right, welcome. Uh, Joyfree, I can see that's my colleague, Joyfree. Uh, welcome as well. So I hope uh, everyone has been well. I know we have like three minutes before time when maybe the rest of the team will join us, uh, but we could just be doing some acquittance. Yes, um, I'm well. Awesome. Yes. All right, good. And uh, Christina as well, it's good to see you here. Yeah, thank, thank you. I'm looking forward to a very interactive and engaging session. Ah, awesome. We look forward. <laughs> All right, good. I can see you, Shalom. I don't know that she's connected well. Um, that's one of our youth uh, leaders. Shalom, welcome. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the class. Wow, glad to see you here. Hi. Uh, yeah, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, you can hear me. Okay, okay, that's fine. That's okay. Um, so I told guys to sign up uh, promptly at eight. Let's see uh, the numbers we shall have, but we will not really wait for long. So immediately after eight, maybe we're gonna start in maybe two minutes or so. So uh, I can see guys are joining now. Rosa, Rosa, are you likely to share screen at a point? Uh, yes, I have a few slides, not much, but just a few that I would want to share. Ah, that's fine, that's okay. I'll, I'll exit my ones I assure you in. Okay. Jeffrey, you can hear me? Jeffrey? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, Karibu, Karibu Sana. Thank you. Let me see who else. Uh, this one who have connected with uh, Nopo is at seven. I'm not so sure the name. Shalom, you could be pre pre preparing to open for us with a word of prayer um, once we kick off. Okay. Yeah, uh, let, let's give people like two more minutes and then uh, we can begin. There are some two participants in this house who are preparing to join. They will be joining in the next few minutes. Ah, awesome. That's okay. We have one minute to time. So, Rose, we are Igare waiting for good news from Uhuru Kenyatta on Saturday. <laughs> uh, yes, we hope you'll have some good news. Yes. But we probably should not set our hopes very high. Uh, actually, Cast is the man who have hopes on uh, another man. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we, anyway, I think um, we are not really expecting uh, uh, too much. I think we are uh, working mm. to learn and adopt and see new opportunities and make the best out of what uh, still comes along. Mm. 
Yeah, like uh, today, yeah. I was talking, today I was talking to some uh, a general manager in a hotel in Voi, and you know he was telling me that they are closing. Actually, they are closing tomorrow. Uh, so I was trying to ask, I was trying to ask him, why are you closing tomorrow? And we have one day before Uhuru announces the news. <laughs> uh, kind of people have already uh -huh. done, you know, done the analysis and see. Yeah, whether I, whether he announce open opening back the economy or not, still uh, people need to adjust on the new normal. Yeah, I guess we need to start learning how to live with it. Exactly. It might be a battle before. Yeah. <laughs> to coexist. <laughs> we need to coexist. Yes. Exactly, exactly. It's gonna be interesting to see how um, these things will unfold. I've seen guys have uh, streamed in, uh, so we'll be beginning in a few. Um, so welcome, those who are joining us uh, for this webinar. Um, we'll, we're just giving people two minutes and then we begin. Uh, and I, we are going to begin with a word of prayer in a few so that we can commit this session before God and then I'll be able to introduce the session and uh, invite our speaker tonight. So let me see who else are coming. Um, yeah, I've seen one of my friends, uh, Moses Mariri. Welcome. Thank you very, oh, very Moses much. Moses is a mutual friend. Yeah, Moses, my good friend. Pleasure to see you here. <laughs> Thank you very, very kindly, Asante. Yeah, welcome. Mwendi, my bishop have joined. Regina, the one with the name Regina is my bishop. I'm pleasure to have her here. Um, it's a good one. So welcome, bishop. Uh, let me see who else we have. I think it's good so that if I have anybody I need to acknowledge, I acknowledge before we begin. Good. So maybe basic housekeeping. Um, we're going to throw our uh, questions um, in the chat section. So as we continue, if you have any question that you may want to post to the speaker, kindly put it on the chat. And then along the way, we will be able to read them. We have, we're going to have an initial approximately 30, 40 minutes uh, session or presentation. And then after that, we're going to have a Q&A session. So kindly put in the questions there, but we are still going to give people maybe one or two who can be able to ask a uh, question live, but we encourage questions to be put on the uh, chat thread so that we can <coughs> consolidate. Then I'll request that uh, we keep muted, uh, apart from the co-host who is my speaker. So I've muted you by default so that at least uh, we avoid the echo background. Good, so allow me to appreciate because I can see part of um, my, my spiritual readers are here. I can see my bishop, I can see one pastor here, Pastor Antonina. So I would like just to, encourage, to kind of uh, appreciate them and then we are going to open with a word of prayer and uh, we get going. So Bishop, I don't know whether you can hear me. We are, we are honored to have you here. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, welcome. Pastor Antonina. All right, Pastor Antonina, I can see you somewhere. Yes, I'm here. Awesome. I'm Good. connected in. I'm okay. Connected here. Okay, pressure. We, we appreciate to have you here. Uh, those two are part of my pastoral teams. Let me show the somebody else. Okay, good. So because of time, we are going to get going. It's four minutes past eight. So I'm going to invite Shalom, who is going to open with a word of prayer. Then I'm going to give a very quick uh, introduction of the session and the speaker. And we get going. So because of time, we are going to get it uh, right away. So Sharon, if you're there, kindly open for us with a word of prayer. Okay, um, let us pray. Uh, Father and our God, we give you praise and glory for yet another opportunity to sit down and learn. 
thank you so much for uh, this as for our facilitators and the knowledge that you have given unto them to be able to impact to us knowledge. We pray that Father, the, the knowledge that we will receive this evening will be beneficial in our lives. That you, with the knowledge that we have received and the power of your Holy Spirit working in us, you are going to cause us to be faithful stewards of the resources that you have given us, and that we will use our resources to advance your kingdom both in. Um, our families, our individual lives, and in the church, and in the body of Christ, and just basically causing us to make an impact in the world that we live in. We give you praise, and we give you glory. We want to pray for a smooth uh, trans transmission of this particular webinar, that there are not going to be challenges, and also we pray for any other person who might be struggling to get into this uh, forum, that Lord, you're going to enable them to get to access this um, session. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, shalom. Um, for reading us with a word of prayer. So as we still have more people streaming in, I'm going to do a quick introduction. First is to welcome all of you. Uh, it's uh, my honor to have you and uh, being able to have a platform where we can be able to engage our thoughts and uh, learn from one another share our experiences and uh, be able to navigate through, especially during this uh, COVID-19 season. This forum has been organized um, by uh, Christ Covenant Church Africa in conjunction with a co my company called Inquest. And uh, we, it was as a result of a response of different challenges that people are facing during this time. And uh, this, of course, includes both spiritual, social, uh, economic challenges that people are facing. And we felt there's a need probably to start empowering people on different life skills that they require to navigate through. And uh, we've had several other sessions talking on different topics, like on health talks, mental health issues, uh, online working, and uh, you know, many other sessions that we have held before. So today focus is geared towards the uh, personal finance success skills because for this time we are being forced to operate with you know the little that we have. Um, if anybody had little savings before, and probably even the little we are continuing to earn on our daily hustles. Um, I mean the economy has been kind of affected generally, and therefore. Uh, even from cash flows and what we have been generating before, most of the businesses are probably making less if there is any. There are those who uh, are working, they are maybe going through payroll cuts, and therefore they're having this little that they have to manage and still have meaningful and dignified life, uh, livelihood, that is. So that's the essence of this session. And um, uh, we are going to have our speaker tonight who is going to share with us some starter thoughts, because again, we cannot cover everything in finance uh, within just a one hour session. So it's going just to trigger some conversations that can at least help us create some uh, even deliberateness or self-consciousness, self-control, to be able even to manage the little resources, the financial resources that we could be accessing during this time. So it's more of a starter session, and therefore maybe after this, we may have more build-up sessions to address specific areas. Then there was a special request uh, around retirement planning, um, which will also be part of this uh, presentation. So we'll have 40 minutes or roughly 30 to 35 minutes thereabout of a presentation from uh, Rose. And then after that, we are going to have a QA and a session where we can be able to engage on areas that the speaker uh, will address. If some questions may not be, uh, be able to be addressed in this uh, uh, webinar, then of course we might consider having them in another uh, subsequent webinar because of time. So because time has already gone and I've already eaten up quite a, like five minutes of our speaker, so allow me to introduce our speaker for tonight. It's somebody that I have known, laugh free, I think could be almost uh, seven, could be seven years if I'm not wrong, or the seven year all about. She is a financial coach um, and a trainer as well, and a consultant. Um, she has been in the financial services sector for quite many years than myself, even if I was in that space. And, uh, you know, she has been able to um, have an opportunity to consult for different people, different organizations, 
and even conduct trainings. Uh, I have uh, listened to her, especially on the pre-retirement trainings, when people are going through uh, work transitions, either they have been retired or they have been retrenched, you know, and they need to be prepared before uh, joining the, the, you know, the, 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 the outside world besides the workplace. So I have, I'm a witness of some uh, work that she has done there, and it's quite amazing that tonight she will be able to share with us this. So um, that is Rose Wakiria. Uh, she's a consultant and trainer, uh, specialized on retirement and personal financial planning. I know she introduced herself further, so allow me uh, to allow her in, and uh, she's going to share the presentation that she has with us, but much more the engagement in terms of what she's going to discuss and the conversation she's going to trigger for us. So Rose, I want to um, introduce you to this team. Part of the majority of this team are within our network of Christ Covenant Church Africa, but there are also now other people who are our friends, like I can see quite a number of my friends outside the church. And therefore, we are having this in context of the faith, which is very good and uh, as part of the kingdom empowerment. So feel free to engage, and uh, I want to welcome you to take over from here, and then may God guide you on the various things that you're going to help us uh, engage you. So welcome. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Gabriel, for your introduction and for inviting me to share this forum with you. And your, your friends and colleagues, it's uh, interesting to, to find that we also have some mutual friends. Moses Mwarili is also a friend of mine. And um, uh, I think you've done most of the introduction, uh -huh. so... Uh, so I think I will, I will not dwell so much, but basically I think we've lost her sound. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Luz, you can uh, just unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, you can hear me now? Yes, you can hear you now. Okay, I don't know how far I have gone, but I, I will back up a bit. So I'm a, pen, I'm a retirement and personal financial planning consultant and trainer, as introduced. And basically, I work with individuals and families to help them plan their finances so that they can actually free their time and talent to do what they actually like doing. I, I realize many of us uh, sometimes are in workplaces where we are there because of the money, not because we feel that's where we want to be. So basically, that is what I do. Yes, I have been in the financial services industry. It's now almost 20 years. And above that, I'm a Christian. And I believe in the Bible truths and especially what the Bible talks about money. So one of the things that I believe that the Bible says is that God owns it all. So all the money and everything in this world Psalms 24 verse 1 says, it all belongs to God, including the money. And that is the worldview that I normally use in my uh, financial and retirement planning. So on to start our webinar, you've mentioned that, yes, we are going to have about 30 to 35 minutes of talk. And then after that, we are going to take questions. Please take, note your questions so that uh, we don't miss out on any so in this COVID-19 space we find ourselves, I, I think it has been a challenge for all of us and I'm grateful to Gabriel and your church for organizing this forum, not only for your members, but also for anyone who's willing to join. And as we find help, uh, there's something I came across uh, from a psychologist, he's called Dr. Henry Cloud. He said that human beings have three main needs and that is the need for connection, the need for control and the need for structure. And interesting, it seems that COVID-19 has attacked all of them. So I believe all of us are trying to get, to maintain that connection, to try and gain control of everything, including our finances. And hopefully you've been able to establish a routine that is sort of giving you some structure. So my presentation is going to take, um, uh, will we'll be divided into four sections. The first one will be just to recap where do we need to plan. 
then I'll talk about when we plan exactly what do we plan. So what, ent what, what is entailed in that plan? And I'll also talk about uh, the important part which most people tend to fail to do, which is how to plan. And finally, I'll give um, a, a few tips on principles that you can apply that can ensure success in your financial management. I'll start with uh, an analogy or uh, maybe something you've heard before. Assume you've been invited to a very important function and one of the things that you realize you need to do is to buy an outfit. You want to look nice on that day. So you realize your wardrobe is missing something important and you need to get one. But you don't sit down and plan and say, this is what I will buy. This is the color of shoe. This is the color of, of a shirt or a top. But as you go about your business, you come across each of those items and you just buy. But you've really never given much thought as to what exactly, how you want to, to put all that together. And I think that is how many of us approach personal finances. We don't start by sitting down and making a plan of how I'm going to manage my finances for my life or for the foreseeable future. Many of us get the hang of it as we move along. You may also have heard about this saying that says, the saying that says that um, give someone a fish and you feed them for a day, teach them how to fish and you, fish, uh, and, and you feed them for a lifetime. But I would want to challenge that and ask, is that really enough? And as we go through our presentation, we'll be able to answer that. So on to where we should plan. Uh, basically, first looking at how the Bible looks at um, finances, because there's a lot that the Bible talks about. Actually, Jesus spent so much time talking about money. Uh, some scholars have said that about 2,300 Bible verses talk directly about money. So it's quite an important aspect of our life. So in that regard, uh, it's important to, to, to actually look at what the Bible talks about. What does it say about money? So money forms a very big part of our everyday life. So it's basically a tool that we use to meet both our needs and also God uses it to meet purposes. So money is a tool. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the things that human beings like to have is control. They want to have as much control as possible of their lives. And in addition to that, the other thing they want to reduce is vulnerability. So you would prefer if you're in a situation where you're able to manage your own affairs. And this is not surprising because even the first test to Adam and he was basically about issue of control and vulnerability. So the temptation is always there for us as human beings to try and get full control of our finances, to get to be in a position where we really don't depend on God. We don't have to wait for him to provide for us, but we want to be able to do it. So again, money now becomes a test and all of us go through this test. So the challenge for you is, will you pass the test? And finally, Another view the, the, the Bible has is that um, money actually, the way we spend our money is actually a, a testimony to the world. Incidentally, you can fake very many aspects of your life, but it is impossible to fake your financial life. It is very, very difficult. So what happens is that if I want to know what kind of a person you are or what you value most in life, all I need to do is to look at how you spend your money. So for this reason, how we spend our money actually affects our testimony. And this makes it very important that before we spend our money or before we use our finances, it's good to sit down and actually see whether we have a plan that will take us in the right direction. So where do we make plans? Uh, to ensure that what is most important remains most important. We are called to be stewards. As I said, I believe that we don't own the money that is in our pocket, in our bank accounts but it's just been entrusted to us for us to manage it. So one of the things we need to do that is to ensure that we're able to do a good job. We've been given a job to manage it and then we need to do it as our master has requested. Also life has a lot of distractions. There's family, there's work, there's church, there's government, there's your community. If you're not planning, then you might be easily distracted and you end up losing your focus. The other aspect of why we need to plan is because we live in a fallen world 
And the one thing about uh, the economies is that they are very uncertain. So there are three economic principles I would want us to take note of that if, if you think finances and you think around these economic principles, then they actually act as a guidance on how you manage your finances. The first one is that economic uncertainty is certain. The only thing you can know for sure is that you will not know what happens tomorrow. You cannot predict what will happen tomorrow in terms of economic uh, activity. No one saw COVID-19 coming, and even when it started, we thought it's probably just a health concern, but it has actually turned out to be a much bigger concern which has affected world economies. So things will come. We just don't know when they will come and what shape they will do. I mean, they will come in, whether it will be a disease, whether it will be terrorism, whether it will be famine, whatever it is. The point is economic uncertainty is certain. That will come. The second principle is that economic cycles are normal. There are always uh, moments of up uh, economy uh, going up or doing very well, and which are normally followed by economic decline. Again, we know that will happen. We just don't know when it will happen and what will trigger it and the kind of impact that it's going to have. And the last one, which we tend to forget a lot, is that economic prosperity is certain, but only in retrospect. So we, we, we tend to see the bad side of uh, economic decline, like now many people are worried, how will they manage their finances? How will they take care of their families, but the one thing for sure is that we'll have better times ahead. When they will come, what form they will take, we do not know for sure. But what we know for sure is that there will be better times. So that gives us hope and enables us to use our money knowing that, yeah, we might be going through a difficult time, but there'll also be periods and moments of plenty that are ahead of us. And finally, the other thing that we need to consider and we need to critically look at it, and this also ties in with retirement, is that financial needs are normally simultaneous, not sequential. The minute you become financially independent or you get an education from your parents and they release you into the world, you need to think about food, you need to think about your own education if you want to pursue higher education, you need to think about retirement, you need to think about how you raise a family. All these things come in and you might be required to be taking uh, or to be planning for many of them at the same time. So life does not give us one need, you fulfill it, then another one springs up. They all come at the same time. So if you fail to plan, and that is basically what happens for many people in regards to retirement, if you fail to plan early, then you find yourself in this cycle of always firefighting, never having enough. And so for those three reasons, then we need to plan. So once we, when we plan, what happens is that our attention and our efforts are directed, they are focused. And when you actually focus on something, you end up doing it very well. The other thing it does is that we become motivated. As you plan on what you need to do and you achieve those things, you actually feel motivated and you continue planning and achieving and that keeps driving you, which is totally different if you don't plan. And then uh, that means then you cannot also be able to measure your progress. Now, it's important that when you make plans, you document them. Many of us make plans in our head and we, 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 we think we have a plan, but what happens is that we don't have a reference point. So when we need to, do, to spend money or to do something, uh, we, are, we are vaguely thinking about, yes, this is what I was supposed to do or this is what was my priority. We only come to realize later when the money is spent that, oh, this is not what I should have done with the money. So document your plans. God keeps on saying, write it down write down, write down. He has the ability to remind us. We have Holy Spirit in us, but he still says, write down. So it is important to put your goals in writing and keep referring them uh, to them from time to time. Now, what do we plan? We know why we need to plan. So what do we plan? Basically, what we need to plan is everything that we do with the money. And the reason is that every financial decision counts. When you choose to spend your money on one item, it basically means that it, that money is not available to be used in any other aspect. Therefore, you need to plan everything. So basically, we can divide um, areas into which our money goes into five. 
I will try and share this screen so that you can go through it together. Um, yes, so I hope you can see the screen. So basically we use our money in five ways. And um, I choose to list them in the order that we should do them, not necessarily in the order that most people do them. So the first use of money is to give. We are instructed to give, the Bible commands us to give. There is so much in the scriptures that encourages us to give. And one of the reasons why the Bible does that is that when you give, whether you have enough or not, one of the things it, uh, that giving does is that it breaks the power of money over you. It is actually an acknowledgement to God saying that, yes, I have very little, I don't have all I need, but I'll still share it. And I trust that you'll continue to provide for my needs. The more you give, the more you enjoy the gift of giving, and the more money stops being uh, having a hold on you. Rose. So we need to plan. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is you're not sharing. Okay. No, you're not sharing. That sounds like um, Kache. Yeah, there's no screen that has come. Sorry. For her. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. The screen is uh, not sharing the slides themselves. It should just show in your, your, your page. You, you can maybe share again. Okay. So do you have it on your screens now? Not yet. Not yet. It seems like uh, my video is is muted and I'm not able to unmute. Oh, yeah, if I did, okay, it had come and gone. Um, okay. Now we can see you, your face. <laughs> so now I need to share the screen. Again, the video is muted. Gabriel, could you try to unmute it from your side? Uh, let me check. Okay, what I can do, let me see. Um, I've requested you to start a video. Just check whether that prompt has come. Okay, we only seen your image, but I think when you share it, it disappears. Yes, uh, that's what's happening. The minute I bring in PowerPoint, the video gets muted. So I guess we'll just proceed without it. Okay, that's fine. That's, that's okay. okay. That's fine. Yeah. So basically, um, there are five uses of money, and I've addressed the first one, which is give. And it's important to plan on how much to give, because if you don't plan on giving, chances are you'll not be able to. So plan how much you should give, and also where to give. There are many areas that you can give. You can give to family and friends. You need to give to church in terms of tithes and offering. We need to take care of those who are poor and in need in our society. And you even need to give uh, for strategic purposes like advancing God's kingdom. The next uh, use of money is O, and this is in form of owing taxes. And then uh, the third one is owing debts. Now, most of us are not comfortable paying taxes, but uh, we need to realize that the, the minute you have some tax liability it means that God has provided for you, we only pay tax on what we have. We, we are never charged for what we do not have. So we need to pay taxes with gratitude as a sign of God's provision. But uh, prudent use of money requires that you try and minimize legally what you can pay in taxes because the government have given you uh, leeway as you plan for other goals to actually minimize your tax liability. And one of the ways they do that is through retirement planning. 
your savings to retirement plannings up to a certain limit, they are tax-free, investment income is tax-free. That is one avenue you can actually take advantage of. The net. Another one you can is in planning to have a home. Their products, home ownership, home ownership savings plans, they also allow you to make savings tax-free and interest is also tax-free to certain limits. And also as you plan for children's education, uh, you can also get tax free, uh, you, you get tax relief from the premiums that you actually pay to insurance companies, and that reduces your tax liability. And the other way you can also reduce your tax liability is when you have a mortgage, um, the interest you pay on a monthly basis up to a maximum of 25,000 per month is actually a tax deductible expense. So wisdom calls that you structure your, your finances such that you don't pay unnecessary taxes taxes that the government has already allowed you not to pay. In terms of debt, um, that becomes another use. For those who are in debt, not everybody is in debt. We know that what the debt does is that it mortgages your future. It actually ties your future income to take care of past debts. So it's important to plan and see what, where should I use debt? Is there any use of debt in my in my financial planning and what kind of debt should that be? And we look at that later when you're looking at the principles. The other use of money is growing. You don't spend all you earn, so you put some money aside that will enable you to meet long-term goals. Remember we said goals are simultaneous. So there'll be some long-term goals. There'll be a mortgage to be taken. There'll be a higher education for your children. You can only meet those goals by putting aside money now and investing it so that it can grow and help you to meet those needs in future. So how much should you save? It's a decision you need to make. And where should you save that money? Because you shouldn't save and just keep that money in cash. You need to invest it so that it can grow and work for you. So again, decisions around what is the appropriate investment for this particular goal. If you need to save, for example, for education, in the next two, to be used in the next two to three years. Putting that money in land for speculation purposes may not be the most prudent way because you might not be able to sell that land when you need the money. Again, a very common mistake uh, with, with most of us. And finally, the balance of what remains after you've given, you've paid your debts, you've paid your taxes, and you've saved is what you're supposed to live on. So, in this area, then we are talking about balancing provision and protection. God requires that we provide for our families, but he never demands that we provide protection for our children or our families. What does that mean? Some people take insurance and they say, what I'm doing is I'm protecting my family. No, you're actually providing for your family. In the event that you're not there, then they will have that provision. Only God can protect. No matter how much money you make, you will never be able to protect yourself or your families from potential uh, financial challenges. So we need to leave that to God. We need to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to be protected by God. And then when it comes to living, then you need to start asking yourself, so how much is enough? I mean, what kind of lifestyle should I have? Uh, if I keep getting more money, does it mean I keep on in enhancing my lifestyle? So there are those decisions that you need to make. Otherwise, it will always be a rat race, learning, uh, I mean, uh, chasing money, improving your lifestyle, upgrading it, and you'll never have the end of it. It's also at this point where you need to start thinking about if God blesses you with money and you have excess beyond what you need, because you can actually determine how much is enough, what will you do with that surplus? We have a very big responsibility. We are all called to be disciples and make uh, disciples all over the world. So you might not be able to go yourself, but you could actually send somebody. And uh, strategic giving for kingdom purposes or any other society problem you want to solve is one of the things that as believers we really, not, we really need to think about. So those are the five uses of money, give, or in terms of taxes, or in terms of debts, grow and live. So, how do we plan? How do we plan? Majority of the things I have talked about are not new to you. You must have had all, I mean, most if not all. But where does the challenge come? Why is it that we do not plan? One of the 
things that we that that uh, makes us not plan well is lack of confidence or lack of knowledge but one of the other things that people do is to focus very much on the past you probably uh, did some had some very bad failures in the past in how you managed your money and you feel trapped to your past or you had some very good achievements and you probably didn't have a good plan and you assume, oh, I don't need to make a plan. After all, things always work out. So when you're making our plans, we shouldn't focus on the past and neither should we focus on our current resources. Because like we said, economic prosperity is certain, but only in retrospect. Our resources will grow. God is not limited by the jobs that we do or the businesses that we do, which probably we have lost through COVID-19. He's not limited. We should actually not use our current resources to make our goals. We need to be ambitious and to pray for God's guidance on what it is that we should be planning for. And for those who are married, when you're making your goals, you should not make them independent of your spouse. And I know this is a very touchy issue. Uh, money conversations are not interesting. Uh, between anyone, whether it's between husband and wife, children and parents, or even employers and employees. But God requires that uh, spouses work together in unity. In God's eyes, he sees you as one. So when you're making independent decisions, which probably are in contradiction, then you're actually not uh, working within his, uh, his umbrella or, or his way of doing things. So how should we plan? We need to make faith goals. You can't have faith apart from God. So basically all I'm saying is that you need to approach God and ask God, okay, you've brought me into this world, you've given me the ability to make wealth, what kind of goals should I have? And he'll guide you into that. Then there are always two parts to any goal. There is your part and there's God's part. So make sure you do your part and God will do his part. I like joking about this when I say about a goal, um, like. Uh, Noah, when he was told to build an ark, it was a, a goal, an audacious goal. He had never seen rain. Uh, he was being told to do a boat, to make a boat, a very huge boat. But what we know is that Noah did his part. He built the boat as instructed, and God brought the rain. So he wouldn't have brought the rain until the boat is ready. You need to do your part, and God will do his part. Remember, it's a faith goal. You consulted God when you're making these goals. And finally, as you do your goals, what you need to look at is that uh, you need to think about what does God think about this goal? I want to buy a car. I want to change a car. I want to buy something. What does God think about it? Because we are using his resources to actually uh, make those goals. So it's important to look at the outcome of your goals and ensure that the outcome will actually glorify God. When you use these as guiding principles, then chances are you'll make very good goals that are in alignment with God's will. And as you do your part, he'll also be able to do your part. So basically, what am I saying? Proverbs 19.20 says, get all the wisdom, get all the advice and instruction you can, so you'll be wise the rest of your life. Majority of us struggle with financial planning. We are not confident. We are not sure. But we don't seek advice. James 1.5 says a similar thing. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And part of that wisdom, he provides it through the scriptures. And Psalms 15 verse 22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they, they succeed. So look for competent professional help and check whether they have conflict of interest. They shouldn't have conflict of interest. They shouldn't be trying to sell you something because they might be tempted to offer you a solution, not necessarily what is best for you, but uh, what they actually provide. So seek counsel and he will give you that uh, wisdom to make the decisions and to actually make your plans. So what are the five principles that if you implement them, I can assure you without fail that you will succeed financially. Why do I sound so, um, so confident about it? Because any financial principle that has worked in the world has its roots in the Bible. So there are five principles. If you apply these ones, all of 
of them, you'll actually succeed. So the first one is spend less than you earn. Second one is build cash flow margin. Third one is avoid debt. Fourth is give generously. And the fifth one is set long-term goals. Again, I don't think there's anything you've never heard about there. Same, same old principles that we need to apply. So let's look at the first one, spend less than you want. Why is it important? And I think I have alluded to that. If you spend all the money that you make, or you spend even more than you make, what happens is that you will not have money to meet your long-term goals. So you remain in this cycle of firefighting, never having enough, always struggling, always caught flat-footed. But if you only set aside, and it really doesn't matter how much you earn, whatever you earn, put aside something small, grow it, and it will actually be able to help you in future. Be content with what you have. God has placed you in a specific area, in a specific um, financial class. The Bible tells us that he's the one who gives us the ability to make wealth. So he gives some people a very huge ability to make wealth, while others it doesn't give as much uh, uh, as the others. So you need to be content with what you have. And if you read Hebrews, I think it's 13, 5, it says, don't love money, just be content with what you have. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll provide for you wherever you are. But there's this narrative, especially the young generation who are saying they don't want to be told to spend less than they earn. What they want is to increase the income. I don't have to limit myself. I just need to grow my income. But this principle applies to everyone. Even if you increase your income and you spend all that you earn, then you still find yourself in the same position. So increase your income if you have, if you're able to, but also ask yourself, what will it cost me to actually increase that income? It may not be in terms of money, but it might be in terms of more important things such as social and spiritual capital. Second principle is build cash flow. This basically means having cash, having money in liquid form that can enable you obligation, meet obligations as they come. The main challenge that many people have is not that they don't have assets. They just don't have cash. So starting your financial planning, one of the things you need to establish first is a, an emergency fund. This is money set aside that can help you maintain the same standard of living or continue living regardless of whether you have an income or not for a period of time, preferably six to 12 months. So for those who had uh, emergency funds and they've lost their jobs, while yes, they are concerned about their future income, they're not very worried about today because they have some money set aside to cover their expenses today. So this is the starting point. When you make some money, don't rush into investments. Put that money in an emergency fund, put it somewhere where it's a bit far removed from you. Uh, it's not in your bank account where you can just use your ATM card. You can put them in some of the investments we call the money market funds. Plan your investments. Sometimes we don't plan how we will invest. We just invest where everybody is or what is now everybody doing. For example, the quill came and everybody put their money there and many burnt their fingers. The other thing people did, they put most of their money in real estate and, and for speculative purposes. How did that serve them? Many of them right now, they have assets worth millions, but they're probably struggling to meet their, their, their expenses. So have some money in cash or in liquid form or in near cash investments. And this will enable you. And one of the things that will do is to keep you away from debt. Because if you didn't have that cash and you had an emergency that needed to be taken care of, you'd have to go into debt. Avoid use of debt. Um, the Bible doesn't have anything positive to talk about debt. But we also notice that it doesn't say debt is a sin. But it shows the folly of using debt. Because the main reasons why people go into debt is because of lack of contentment or poor planning or lack of discipline. You just want to have something right now. As you consider taking debt, ask yourself, why am I taking this debt? What is the root cause? What is the main motivation? And check whether that would glorify God. There are instances where debt can actually make sense. And the first rule that we normally use is make sure that the economic benefit of that debt is higher than economic cost. If it is not, then it doesn't make sense. You'll actually be benefiting the lender more than, uh, more than you, you will be benefiting. And the other thing that even as Christians, we tend to forget 
is when we rush into debt, you have an emergency, you have an issue, and, and the first thing you do is to start making plans of how you're going to borrow. Many of us have robbed God an opportunity to provide for us. But if you only will pray and ask him, how do we go about this? We know he doesn't like debt. He doesn't say much uh, positive about debt. Chances are he has a plan to provide for you either directly or even through other people. So only go into debt if there is no other way of doing it. And if the motivation for going into debt is right, in exception of certain emergencies, there are certain emergencies like medical emergencies, you probably might need to go into debt. But if you've been doing proper planning, chances are you will not need to, to go into debt. Give generously. I think I already talked about that. This is a principle. It's all over the, uh, the Bible. There's so much the Bible talks about it. It's basically an act of faith. You're acknowledging God's provision and trust that he will provide for you. It's an act of obedience. He commands that we give. And one of the greatest givers uh, I know, I have, I have read his story and I have, I, I have interacted with some of his materials, is called Bill Bright. Bill Bright is the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. And he was a very successful entrepreneur in Hollywood. He had made a lot of money, but when he converted, he became a Christian. One of the things he said, he realizes that God owns everything. So he actually made a contract and gave God, he said, everything belongs to you. And God gave him a plan, and that's how he started Campus Crusade for Christ, which has impacted the youth all over the world. And when you read his story or watch his videos, I can share a link at the end of this presentation. Eventually, he made so much money. So the fact that he gave everything to God, it doesn't mean that he lived in want. If anything, God uses them as conduits. We also know the story of Rick Warren. He's a reverse tither. He lives on about 8% of his income, and he gives about 92% of his income, and God has blessed him immensely. The book he wrote, uh, The Purpose Driven Life, it's one of the, I think it comes probably close to the Bible in terms of the number of copies that have been sold worldwide. So he continues to make a lot of money, but he channels all of it, uh, most of it, towards God's kingdom, and he has never lacked. And finally, the last principle, set long-term goals. Again, emphasizing the, the nature of our needs, that they are simultaneous, not sequential. And this is where we forget about retirement. We live for the day and we forget retirement. So why should we do this? One of the things is that when you, make, uh, when you, when you manage your finances with a long-term perspective, you actually make wiser decisions. Let me give you an example. If you intend to buy a house, Depending on whatever stage of life you are in, you, you need to, to think about what kind of a house do I need? Is it the kind of house I need now when I have three, four children, house girl and visitors coming? Or 10, 15 years down the line, all these children will be out of home and I will not need all that space. So for people who are cash strapped, you don't have all the money that you need, investing in a very big home will probably put all your money there and you not even have money for other investments. So towards retirement, and this is very common with very many people, these people are, we, we normally call them uh, house rich. They have a big house, a nice house, but they don't have money. They don't even have money to take care of their expenses. So as you make these decisions, think about the long-term nature of that need. It's likely to evolve and it's likely to change. So you need to look at that perspective and make an informed decision. The other thing about long-term perspective is that if you, if, for example, you start saving, and this is where retirement benefits come, start saving early on, then you only need to put in a few savings and you, your money will work for you and you'll actually have a big fund at retirement. Let me share an example. If you're 25 years old today, you've just left college and you have an income, you can earn 2,000 shillings, I mean, you can save 2,000 shillings per month, and you keep growing that 2,000 shillings every year by 10%. So the first year you save 2,000 per month, the next one 2,200, you keep growing it like that. You put it in the right investment, which in this case would be a retirement benefits plan, where you have tax advantages on contributions, tax advantages on investment income, tax advantages as you access your money. And you assume an interest rate of 10% year on year. 
and then you retire at age 60, you'll actually have a fund of 20 million, approximately 20 million. But out of the 20 million, you'll only have contributed 30% of it, which is about 6 million. And the 14 million will actually be interest income. Now, if you're only contributing 2,000, definitely you will be able to continue with other things. It doesn't mean that all your money is put in invest, I mean, in retirement planning. So this is an example of having a long-term perspective. If you wait another 10 years, you'll have to put in a lot of money. If you wait another 10 years when you're 40, you'd probably need to start at around 14,500 uh, per month to be able to arrive at the same figure. So start early. And uh, finally tied to this is that uh, when you live your life with a long-term perspective, it actually affects not just your financial aspect, but the entire life. Many of us focus on building financial capital, ensuring we have enough money, and we forget the spiritual and the social capital. Yet, if you pursue spiritual capital, it will actually give you all the wisdom that you need to actually make the money that you need. Social capital becomes very important because money cannot buy everything. And, and when you have that money, one of the things you will need is those social relationships. You can't enjoy money or anything alone. You need your family members, you need your children and all that. The other thing we tend to do is that we neglect our children when we are busy making money, busy looking for money. And what we end up doing for some is just to pass the wealth and not the wisdom. Wealth does not guarantee wisdom. But if you give your children wisdom, wisdom in most cases will come with wealth. So you just need to plan your life well. Don't spend all your resources on making financial resources. And the interesting thing about retirement is that research has shown that the number one factor that uh, determines whether you'll be satisfied in retirement is actually not money, but it is actually your relationships, closely followed by a sense of meaning, and then finances come last. So we could be having this whole picture all wrong. When, when we think retirement, we think mainly about finances, but we actually need to ensure that we are looking at the three of them both fin I mean, financial, social, and spiritual. And we need to lay a lot of emphasis on the social and the spiritual capital. Finances will give you a good standard of living, but social and spiritual capital will give you quality of life. Which one would you rather have? Quality of life? Or would you rather have, um, uh, I mean, a higher standard of living? So another thing is that, I know I'm, I'm, I'm actually pushing it. I just have two more slides. Retirement uh, is actually not a biblical concept. I'm a retirement planner and I do that with that full knowledge. But in our context, we call it retirement. Only leaders retire in terms of the biblical concept. The word retire appears uh, not very many times in the Bible and the main uh, area it appears is when the Levites, the leaders were, were, were retiring, but they were not retiring to go home and do nothing. They were teaching and equipping the younger ones with the skills that they already had. So we are not called to retire, go home and do nothing. No. We are supposed to change location, to change assignments. So we need to find out exactly what Ephesians 2.10 means for us. When the Bible says that we've been created, we are God's handiwork, we are God's masterpiece, created to do the works that he prepared for us well in advance. Which are those works? Many of us uh, assume it is the jobs that we do. But even when looking at Jesus' example, Jesus was a carpenter by profession, but that is not why he came on earth. He had a mission. He was the Messiah. He was the Savior. So you probably have a career, a profession, but you need to find out from God exactly why did he put you here so that you don't just live here doing your job, and you end up missing out on the most important thing. And for many people, they have actually found time after retirement as a very good opportunity to actually pursue what God had for them. And they've actually lived very meaningful life. And we have very many examples. Moses at 80 years, Abraham encountered with God at 75 years. Our pres first president, Mzejo Mokenyata, he became a president at 67. 
And even US, Trump became a president at 70 years. And for him, it was a career change. <clears throat> he was a businessman, now he became a politician. So even for you, it is not too late. <clears throat> Start investing in finding out what is it that God really created me for. Spend time with him. That is the only way you'll be able to find that. So you need to spend time on yourself, time with your family members, time with the relationships that matter. Choose to live intentionally with a long-term perspective. Do the hard work now, because if you don't do it now, you'll pay it later and it, you'll pay it with, with interest. So one of the things I would recommend that you do is get to know yourself well. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What, what is your personality like? What is your, your financial personality profile? What is your love language? What are your values and what are your family values? And do the same thing for your spouse. Do the same thing for your children. As you get to do this, you'll actually come to discover the, the things that you can actually do or the things that you can actually do together as a family. And it will become more clear how you can actually develop in terms of social and spiritual capital. Invest time in relationships that matter. And of course, the, most, the one that matters the most, it is the relationship with God. God has all the answers that you'll be looking for. I will direct you to him. You go to him, you get all the answers, whether it is in terms of how do I make money, how do I manage my money, or how do I help my family to, to manage their own money. Any need you have, God actually has um, the answer. So I will share with you, I will share with Gabriel to give to you the, the various tests that you can do. One is about value and money, and this helps you to know what kind of a personality do I have when it comes to finances. And it can help you understand your spouse or your children, why they behave the way they behave when it comes uh, to money. There's also a test for couples to see whether they are thriving in love and in money. And this can be a conversation starter as you do your assessment, each person does separately, and then you can come back and uh, compare. I'll also send you Briggs Myers personality type, which can, can help you to learn your children's personality, what would suit them, or even your spouse. And I'll also send you a risk profile test, which would help you see what is my kind of risk tolerance when it comes to investments, because many of us go into investments that we don't feel comfortable about. And then we end up not serving the purpose. So you buy this outfit, you buy this pair of shoe, you buy this shirt, and then when you put them together, you realize you can't wear that outfit to the event that you want to do. So get to know yourself and get to make the right decisions. So go back to the quote that I started with. Give someone a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach them to fish and you feed them for the rest of their life. Basically what you're doing is you are giving them a rule or a principle, like we've just shared the five principles, and you help them solve one problem. But as human beings, we don't just have one problem. We have many problems. So in the words of George, John Eldridge, he's the author of the book called Walking with God. He says, teach people to walk with God. Then you have helped them solve the rest of their life. They will be able to tap into the inexhaustible source of guidance, comfort, and protection. So my role as a financial advisor, retirement planner is usually to help you manage all these things. We'll give you principles, we'll give you rules, but my main role is to help you walk with God, direct you back to God, so that he'll be able to, to, to solve the rest of your problems. And as you navigate through life, you actually know that you're not alone. He says he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. And that is true because I have experienced that and I can, I can talk about it. And many people have experienced that as they involve God in their finances. Resist the temptation to be in full control of everything and not to be vulnerable to God. He does not want us to be independent of him, including in our finances. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'm sorry, I've taken a little bit too much. Back to you, Gabriel. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Rose. That was very profound and uh, deep. Um, I think that that's like almost going through a book exposition. And I like the way you have been able to link it to uh, faith and uh, Bibiri core perspectives, which is very, very uh, clear. So um, I want to appreciate you for that. And uh, let me see whether there is any chats on uh, any questions that could be there. Um, there's somebody who is saying that they missed a second point. I'm not so sure, Antonina whether this was in the principles of planning or where maybe you'll be able to clarify that. But let me open up uh, the session uh, for probably we're going to do 10 minutes uh, Q&A. If you have any question, you can unmute yourself, speak, and then you mute yourself back uh, so that you can be able to redeem time. So we can do a quick uh, Q&A and then we get to the end of this session. So anybody with a question? So anybody with a question, you can feel free to unmute yourself, pose a question, I will then maybe put it in the chat. I'm going to pick it up and uh, read it for the facilitator. So maybe Rose, just as I wait for people to navigate through their mics, I know probably they are trying to comprehend all this. It was a crash program. Um, in terms of uh, having cash reserves on that principle, um, many people will always struggle with uh, how do I really come up with a ratio to know how much uh, cash should I have as a cash reserve or near cash, that is the asset that you can be able to liquidate to cash vis-a-vis -vis maybe the ones that you put in more long-term investment. Is there a roughly kind of a global a uh, rate or a, a ratio that somebody can begin with, um, maybe at a beginner level? Yes, there is. Uh, basically, an emergency fund is supposed to assist you with those unforeseen expenses and unforeseen circumstances like now, there are many people who've lost their jobs or their businesses are not doing very well. So what you need to assume is that if you lost your job today, what are those bare minimum expenses that you must meet? If you are renting, you need to pay rent, children need to go to school, people need to eat, but the other things you don't have to do if you don't have an income. So the principle is if you're in a stable job, you can keep three months to six months worth of those living expenses. So that budget is slightly less than your usual budget because you're only taking care of those things you must do if you don't have an income. If your job is uh, shaky or you're in an industry where maybe it's affected by many economic factors like tourism, very sensitive to many things, you probably need a bigger fund. So use your living expenses and put about six months to 12 months. For people in business, again, it depends with how stable your business is, but if you're in a, a business that is easily affected by many factors, you're encouraged to put 12 months to 24 months worth of living expenses. So sometimes you feel like this is a lot of money. It is just lying in a money market account, only earning me 8%. But what you need to know is that this is the foundation on which you're building your financial life. So the foundation is usually underground. No one sees it. You put in a lot of work there, but that is what ensures that your house stands. So it is very important to lay that solid foundation. And then as you build your house, then you know when the storms come, because believe me, they will come. You'll be able to stand. Wow. Awesome. Thank wow. you. Awesome. Um, I know we have gener uh, maybe millennial generation in the group. Uh, I will have wished to hear a conversation around them. Maybe when you talk about retirement, they are wondering, uh, why are you thinking about 50 years to come and I need just to survive for now? And, you know, um, I know it's, a, it's a very heavy conversation for millennial generation in the workplace, telling them that one day they will retire. In fact, they don't imagine themselves retiring. So, but when they are uh, hit forties, like some of us, is when now reality comes. I don't know what could be that um, the language to use to communicate retirement to the millennia, um, just to make them see the essence and why they need to start uh, being proactive in that. I don't know whether maybe in your interaction is a wisdom for the millennia specifically. Uh, 
what I've come to realize is that um, you need to spend more time with them. Uh, millennials will probably not benefit from just a talk you do. They have very, very many questions and you need to, to explain to them. And one of the things that parents can do is to share their stories. Most parents don't share their financial stories with their children. Let them know where you started, the sacrifices you made, what you could have done differently, what you need to do differently. Uh, when you do that, that means you need more interaction with them, then they'll probably be able to see, maybe not retirement, but you'll probably be able to talk to them in terms of you need to plan for, you might want to go back to school, you'll definitely probably want to get married, you probably need to have some children. Just enabling them to see the, the, the more relevant or the things that they can see closer now so that they can also be able to tell that okay fine if this is necessary then i might also want to retire early actually for them i think what they want is to retire early there's this word they use fire financially independent retire early but what they need to know is that even if you want to retire at 40 you still need to have a financial base that you'll be able to retire on so it calls for more involvement and this responsibility of teaching the young ones is actually something that God's word tells us. Sit with your children, talk to them, tell them what God has done and also tell them what God has done in your life and, and what you are doing with your finances. So it calls for more participation from uh, the parents, the older generation who are already struggling with uh, financial management. So it's an interesting space, but you don't tire, you continue doing it, you continue teaching them, explaining to them, very soon they catch up. Those who go into formal employment, some of them will be fortunate because it's probably a mandatory savings plan. But those who go into business, probably you need to tie that to a, a goal that they can relate to. You want to retire early, you want to start another business uh, at age 40, at age 30, then you still need to save for that purpose. All right. Thank you. I don't think I can provide anything there. That's very impressive. Uh, I can see comments just appreciating. That was a very powerful presentation. And uh, kindly, if you may want to access, we have recorded this uh, uh, session. So if you want maybe to access this, please make sure you leave your phone number on the chat. Uh, I'm going to share also maybe a WhatsApp number later, which you can be able to drop in, and I'm going to share with you the recording, both on video. It will be available for only two days, so you make sure that you watch it before we pull it down in two days' time. So I want to see whether there's anything else on the chat. Um, yeah, Loza, we like the way you brought in the spiritual perspective in your topic. I think that was very commendable and uh, very, very clear. So anybody else? I just want to give yes. you one. And, um, yep, yes, please. Uh, that's uh, leverage CK. Yeah, question okay. on the cash on the building cash flow. Where are those uh, money market funds? Where do we access? Yes, uh, that's that's a good question. The money market uh, funds. How do you Yes, I normally call money markets basics. After you have a bank account, that's the next thing everybody needs to do because if you have 100,000 shillings right now uh, and it's in the bank, it's probably not earning anything or maybe whatever the rate will be way below the treasury bill rates, which are around 7%. But most of the money markets right now are earning between 8 and 9%. So. Money market funds are normally provided by financial services companies. There are about 30 of them. Uh, financial services companies include uh, financial services groups like insurance companies. Most insurance companies will have money market funds. If I just mentioned a few, like ICA Lion will have one, Sunlam has one, uh, Britam has one, <clears throat> uh, UAP, Old Mutual, all these big companies. Some banks also have these funds. You can actually get that list from the website of uh, Capital Markets Authority. That is the regulatory body that uh, licenses them. And you can also get that, uh, some of them in the newspaper. 
for those who look at the business section, there's usually the, the page where you have the shares. On the right, there's usually a section for unit trusts. Those are some of the funds that we are talking about. They are very easy to operate and they operate almost like a bank account in the sense that it's very easy to access your money. You need to withdraw for your money, but within two to three days, you are able to get them. For those who would be interested, I would be willing and happy to help you um, open up one or, I mean, look at whether you need to open one and where you can actually open one. So I can assist you with that or any person who works with those financial services companies, uh, insurance agents, banks, they will be able to help you with that. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, just to affirm that, um, don't keep your money in the bank account. Uh, if you put your money in some of these platforms, like uh, those uh, money markets, it's almost like the bank. In fact, I have seen nowadays they have already built some integration where the way you have your ATM and you can swipe it on the supermarket to buy, you can almost buy even with, they have made it so liquid that you can access that money just like it's seated in the account yet it is already earning and that's a recommendation so it's much more preferred than uh, putting the money in the bank account i have seen a question here rose it's asking uh, is it advisable to build your personal house to occupy when you retire or do rental houses i think maybe she's focusing on uh, if you get that retirement package do you build your personal house or do you put in rentals for getting extra income <laughs> <laughs> um very interesting question, and, 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 and that is why we exist as financial planners. Now, I wouldn't be able to answer that question unless I know a lot of information about you. First of all, I would need to know, do you have any other source of income? Do you have dependents? Do you have people who depend on you? Do you still have children in school? Do you have parents who depend on you? It's, it's not an answer that suits everybody. Remember, I also talked about your financial personality profile. Well, for some people, that would be okay. For someone else, they would not have sleep at night because um, right now, not everybody is able to pay rent. COVID-19 has just messed everything up. We never thought um, investing in property would have such high risks. So it is important to actually do a proper financial plan because um, there are so many other aspects I need to look at to see whether that is the appropriate investment for you. But one of the things we encourage, one of the, of the things we recommend is that in retirement, please have your own home, if you can. You don't want to be thinking about rent. You don't want to be thinking about being thrown out of your home. At retirement, it would be good to have a place you call home. All right. But as to whether property right. investment is the right thing for you, I think we need to have more discussions on that before I can answer that question. It's, it's, it's on a case by case basis. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Maybe last question, then we are going to wrap up. Our time is really gone. Um, we need to do justice for that time. So, anybody, the last question, and then we close it up. Can I ask my? Uh, that's Lev again. Yes. Okay, yeah, can I right. Ask? I wanted to see whether there's anybody else. If not, then you can also pick it up. That's okay. Then I don't see anybody else uh, showing interest. Quickly, just uh, do so. You can ask. I think I think my question may not be necessarily be answered fully today. But how do somebody come out of uh, some of the debts and uh, some of the things that you are already engaged in? And they are really pressuring one. How do you come out of the uh, slavery of debt? Yes, uh, debt is a, it's, it's a trap. It's actually a trap that uh, gets bigger and bigger. And it's good to get out of it as, as soon as you can. Now, one of the things you need to do is to, again, go back to the basics and to remember who owns all these things that you have. Probably God does and own your debts, but who owns the things that you're, you're buying with the money that you're borrowing? They don't belong to you. So if they belong to God, you need to hold the things of this world loosely. Don't cling to them. So if some of the things you have purchased actually are causing you to, 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 to be very financially strained, one of the things you can consider is at the appropriate time, 
you need to let go of some of those things. Many people have a lot of land. Many people have assets that are currently not producing an income. You probably need to sell some of those things because they're, they're probably doing more harm to you than good. So one of the things is to look, is there anything that you can sell so that you're able to cover the other debts? If then there isn't, the other thing you need to look at, are you living within your means? Definitely, you're not living within your means. That's why you're actually going into debt. You, you need to start mm -hmm. living within your means. Then the next step is live below your means so that you're able to set aside some money and then you start paying off your debt. So let's assume either your salary has gone up or you've been able to make some savings. You have some extra cash that now you can start attacking your debt. How do you go about it? List all your debts, all of them, not combine each separately and look at the smallest debt and see whether you can be able to clear that. Use the, use the savings or the extra cash that you have to clear that debt. Then don't start expanding and buying other things. Use now the total repayment, the one you added and what you are already paying on that debt and you attack the next smallest debt. And then you keep on adding up and then you keep on attacking the next debt. We call that the snowball method. It's the easiest way of clearing debt. So some people ask, should I attack the debt that has the highest interest rate or should I actually pay the debt, uh, the smallest debt? My advice is attack the smallest debt because one of the things that you're going to do is that you're going to clear that debt. If you had 10 debtors, 10 people who are knocking on your door for money, now you'll have nine and then you'll feel motivated. Then you'll be able to finish the next smallest debt much faster and then you'll have eight people knocking on your door. So that will actually motivate you to actually continue clearing your debt. Now, what happens when you clear? Then use the amount now you are paying for all your debts. At this point, it should be very huge amount and start saving that money and then start making your purchases cash so that you get completely out of debt. This is something I have done. I was in debt once. And I actually used that method and it took such a short time. It's amazing. Things move very, very, very fast. And pray about uh, for God to help you um, with the debts. As, as, you, as you start that process and you start obeying his principles, he also comes in and, and gives you a lot of increase and you're able to take care of that. But the most important thing is actually to make a decision not to go into debt because some people clear debts as they are piling other debts at the top. So you resolve not to go into debt and then you, you make savings or you get an extra income and then you start attacking the small debt and you keep on rolling that amount into the next debt until you finish the last debt. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much Rose. again, um, uh, Rose, for that. And let you leverage for asking those very practical questions. So we've come to the end of this session. And uh, I know it may not have been enough time to really get into the meat of this. But we hope that this has become like a starter conversation, being a bit more conscious and aware of your uh, financial well-being and some basic steps that you can already start uh, practicing right now. Uh, so as we, uh, Rose have promised, she's going to sell with us several our uh, various assessments and I'm going to circulate to you. So kindly make sure that you drop your number on the chat box uh, or else I have a slide that I'm going to show the contacts you can also use and we are going to respond back to you uh, with even the recording of this. Uh, but allow me quickly just to also position one of the areas that I know uh, Rose have covered is about the giving. Uh, we continue supporting those people who do not have food during this time. And it's good also as a charge to tell you what we are doing. So we have an initiative for the COVID-19 support. And uh, if you may want to support uh, any family that is not uh, able to uh, raise their daily meal and all that, we have a, 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 a wallet that we are using for this. So anybody is free to be able to give anything. If you have food, uh, let me know. I can liaise with my church team leaders to be able to know how we can drop that food. We are donating that food every Saturday. So kindly let's also exercise that uh, giving, uh, spill it, as even those have already shared that as part of the 
um, ways in which we need to spend our money. So, but finally, um, I have showcased the contacts there. Uh, you can WhatsApp that number in case you need more information and the resources that Lowe's is going to share and I'm going to engage uh, with you and make sure you get it uh, as soon as uh, they are shared. We are also going to share the link with this recording so that you can view it in the next two days, maybe up to Sunday, just to refresh yourself. That time you can be able to you know, go through it with a notebook and put in some actionable uh, uh, you know, things that you can be able to uh, exercise and also get somebody to hold you accountable. Much more, seek wisdom uh, from the word of God and also accountability within the fellowship of believers. We are surrounded by brethren. So they can also hold you accountable in some of the things that you're going to commit into this. So I want to say thank you very much, Rose, but let me allow, I don't know whether Bishop is still in this. Is Bishop, are you still around? I would like you maybe just to whisper a word of prayer as you also maybe appreciate uh, uh, Rose, and then we are going to close. So Bishop, if you're there, can you Yes, Before yes, that, can I, make, uh, yes. I, would, I would also want to acknowledge um, some of the people I can see who joined here. One of my pastors is here, Pastor Isaac Murag, Reverend Isaac Murage. Thank you for joining in. Uh, Big Dave, my daughter Sue is here. Uh, Sam Konzi was here. Skita Mbogwa, Purity Wakibiru, Moses Mwariri. We already talked about that, Kimaru and others. Thank you very much for making your time and joining us. We really appreciate you being here. Nina Uma as well. Wow, awesome. Thank you very much for honoring this, uh, even Lou's friends and uh, even that bishop. Uh, thank you very much for such a great honor. Uh, I had not known that I could have been able to appreciate, but we appreciate uh, your attendance here. So maybe because of time, uh, bishop, if you're there, you can use for us. Yeah, allow me to appreciate Rose for that amazing presentation. Um, I actually had a question, but maybe it may not be uh, answered right now. Um, I know of a person who, I don't know how this one can be placed, but it's just a person who just gives and gives and gives and gives. Sometimes without plans, he just gets somewhere, gets a need, and the next thing he's doing is just gives and sometimes help. So I think it's an interesting question. Maybe it can be answered on another time. But thank you so much, Ross. We really appreciate it. It has been so enriching. It is a lot of information. And uh, I would maybe also thank Gabriel so much for making this information to reach our people. And uh, it couldn't have happened if it were not for your commitment and also your kingdom um, attitude that everything should be done for the kingdom. So I really, really appreciate the talk and I, I think we need more, we need much more. So may the Lord bless you so much, Rose. Uh, I appreciate the pastor, uh, your pastor who is on board. May God also bless him for having such a big fish. So I also want to acknowledge our pastors. I can see Reverend uh, Kamau, uh, Pastor Anne, Pastor Antonina, and Pastor Kefa. I can also acknowledge our uh, elders. I have seen Doreen. I have seen Elliot. I have seen Esther. I have also seen some other leaders like Jeff and Long, Eve, Phoebe, and Jemu. I want to thank you so much for planning to be here. And I know that our finances shall not be the same. Our planning for finances shall not be the same again. So God bless you so much. Have a blessed night. Let us close our eyes and pray. Our Heavenly Father and our God, we thank you because of such an enriching talk that we have had tonight. Thank you so much for Rose and thank you for the great wisdom that you have imparted in her on how to manage our finances. Lord, we want to thank you because of the spiritual aspect of money and where we started in the book of Psalms 24 verse 1 that everything belongs to you, including us, we belong to you. So we ask you that you may help us 
to be very good custodians of the resources that you have entrusted us with, that at the end of it all, we shall be found faithful before you because we never embezzled your money by doing things that were not a priority for the kingdom advancement. We pray, dear Lord, that you are going to give us much more wisdom as we seek you on this important issue of managing finances. Lord, at the conclusion of it all, is that we should learn how to walk with you. Because when we walk with you, we are going to get all the wisdom that we need in planning our finances. And I pray for every participant tonight that this is going to be a great and a cardinal consideration from now on, on how close we are walking with you. Because when we are close to you, the more you are going to impart to us these rich uh, principles of managing our finances and our resources. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. So bless us for the rest of the night. And we pray that you may bless every one of us that has been here. For we ask of this trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, you. Amen. thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, thank you. So welcome. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's all keep safe and uh, continue praying for the government as uh, we seek wisdom on how to navigate. So allow us to add there. Again, Lowe's, God bless you so much and any other person who have been able to uh, honor this. God bless you and then lead you uh, abundantly. Thank you for having me. Thank you. God bless. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.